you know, teach lessons or don't preach sermons. I wonder if you understand or realise how much effort goes in in preparation. Now, I know myself that it takes a significant number of hours to do some study and some research and then finally you collate it together and have a, a half hour sermon. Well there's probably 15 or more hours, 20 hours research have gone in for me. I'm not like Pastor Adrian, he can take something in about 10 minutes. But, but not for me, it takes me about 15 or 20 hours. So here you get this time now where I've done all this research, but the blessing, the blessings that we receive in doing the study and the research, because, you know, God's Word has been given to us so that we can study it, that we can understand what He has to say to us in a simple fashion. We don't have to be... Uh, doctorate, uh, have doctorates, we don't have to be um, scholars in any way, shape or form. Although just a, a funny little story that happened to me the other day. For a while now, uh, when I'm going through my um, some notes and that on my computer, a pop-up has been coming up and it says, how much do you know the Bible? How well do you know the Bible? I think it was. And I just kept ignoring it, not sure, not sure where it would head or whatever. Anyway, I clicked on it the other day. And so it had about 60 questions, I think, to go through. So I clicked through them, and I got each one right. And when, it, when, it, when I had completed this tiny survey, it says, congratulations, you must be a scholar. <laughs> no, I'm not a scholar. But I just happened to know my Bible well enough to answer all these questions. And so I thought that that was interesting. We've just sung a hymn, Give Me the Bible. Do you mean that? Do you really mean that you want God's Word to be presented to you today? I hope that is the case because that's what I intend to do. And uh, trust that you'll be blessed as we go through this study. But before we begin, we must pray. Gracious Father, as we open your Word, as we look through the words that you inspired your prophets of old to write, we ask please that you will bless us with a measure of your Holy Spirit, that we will be enlightened, our minds will be opened, our hearts softened, and that we, can, we will receive the truths we pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favourite books that I read at home is this one called The Great Controversy, written by Ellen White. If you have never read it, I encourage you to do so, because it is a, uh, a letter of love as far as the Christian church is concerned, and it teaches us many great uh, truths and many things, particularly as we live in the time in which we do. So I'd just like to share just a, a few little snippets out of it before we begin. And it says, beginning on uh, page 593, and interestingly enough, this chapter is called The Scriptures, A Safeguard. And it says here, None but those who have fortified the mind with the truth of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. You need to think about that. What is it, what is it to fortify your mind? I'll use another word. None but those who have strengthened their mind with the truth of the Bible. None but those who have allowed themselves to be inspired by the truth of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. On page 595, it says this, God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. So how, how important to us, church family, is the Bible to be? Satan is constantly endeavouring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads people to look to bishops, to pastors, to professors of theology as a guide, instead of searching scripture for themselves. And so once again, I'd like to draw your attention to God's word. As we consider who God is, can we really know? I'd like to turn to Job 11 and verse 7. We'll look at a few verses this morning. 
Job chapter 11 and verse 7. For those of you who have got your Bible, I ask you, please, please turn your pages. And if you haven't brought your Bible, well, I would like to encourage you to do so next time that you come to church. Because it is important that you have God's Word. It is also important that you make sure that what I'm reading is, is right. Job chapter 11 and verse 7 says, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? That, that's a good question, isn't it? Can, can we as human beings find out God? So Isaiah 55 and verse 9 is, a, is my next verse. Isaiah 55 and verse 9. And the Bible says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we as human beings, as created human beings, as we consider... Who is God? What is God? Where is God? As we consider anything about God, we can only go so far in our reasoning, as far, in fact, as God has allowed us, or God allows us to, in, in, in what he has revealed about himself. To go beyond that leaves us in a precarious position, where we, in fact, may find ourselves wandering from what, is, in fact, has been revealed, to the point where we can start making God into something or somebody who he is not. So God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. John 17, John chapter 17 and verse 17 is another scripture that I find very encouraging. John chapter 17 and verse 17. Jesus is praying and he says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So here we have um, Jesus himself saying that God's word is truth. That, that the word is truth. And it's important for us to understand that. Our next verse is, is 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. And I found this an interesting verse as I put this into my study this morning. It says here, study is the first word that it says in my Bible. Study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I decided to open up the concordance and to see what this word dividing, rightly dividing, uh, meant. And the word itself, the Greek word, and if I pronounce it incorrectly, Adrian, you won't mind, it's orthotomeo. That's the, the Greek word, and it means to cut straight. So I put my mind onto this for a moment and thinking, Rightly dividing God's word, rightly cutting it straight. And I could see in, in my mind cutting something open and laying it aside, laying it, laying it apart and examining the layers of it as you go through. And I thought to myself, well, that's a great example or a great word that is used in Scripture to understand how we read the Scripture from its surface and start going deeper and deeper into the truth as we lay it open, as we cut it straight and lay it open that we can find God's word in a deeper and a deeper sense so that we understand more and more of what he has to say. In Matthew 15 and verse 9, Jesus is speaking. Matthew 15 and verse 9. He says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And I, I was interested in that point. So I decided to do some more study on that too. And I found in the book Evangelism, chapter 142, the title of the chapter is Satan Gains Foothold Through False Doctrines. I'd just like to read this piece to you. Error draws its life from truth. Satan has wrought with deceiving power bringing in a multiplicity of errors that obscure truth. Error can not stand alone, but would soon become extinct if it did not fasten itself like a parasite upon the tree of truth. Error draws its life from the truth of God. The traditions of men, like floating germs, attract themselves, or sorry, attach themselves to the truth of God, and men regard them as a part of the truth. 
through false doctrines, Satan gains a foothold and captivates the minds of men, causing them to hold theories that have no foundation in truth. Men boldly teach for doctrines the commandments of men, and as traditions pass on from age to age, they acquire a power over human mind. But age does not make error truth, neither does its burdensome weight cause the plant of truth to become a parasite. The tree of truth bears its own genuine fruit, showing its true origin and nature. The parasite of error also bears its own fruit and makes manifest that its character is diverse from the plant of heavenly origin. It is through false theories and traditions that Satan gains his power over the human mind. We can see the extent which he exercises his power by the disloyalty that is in the world. Even the churches that profess to be Christian have turned from the law of Jehovah and have erected a false standard. Satan has had his hand in all this, for by, for by directing men to false standards, he misshapes the human character and causes humanity to acknowledge him as supreme. He works counter to the holy law of God and denies God's jurisdiction. It is at his throne that every evil work finds its starting point and obtains its support. In Ephesians chapter 4, we find here that we are given some sound instruction by the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 4. It's, it's uh, in the chapter we're speaking about uh, the giving, giving of some gifts, and it doesn't mention many gifts, but starting in verse 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and, and some, some evangelists and some pastors, pastors and teachers. teachers. For, for the, the perfecting of the saints, saints for, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Our Lord wants us, the body, body of Christ, to be uplifted, uplifted to be edified, edified, to be strengthened. Till, till, till we, we all come in the unity of the faith and, and, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, under the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. And this, and this is, is the important part, part that, that we henceforth be no more children, children tossed to and fro, and, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know, it is, it is known by some who, who, who teach, teach and lead into false theories, theories and false, false doctrines. It is well known what they're doing, or they well know what they're doing. And so we trust and pray that as a church, we will be wise and we will know God's word. Because it is simply by knowing the scripture that we are able to uh, detect false doctrines. I have a $10 note here. And it says on it about being the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and how it is this, this note is recognized in New Zealand as $10. And if I held it up, if, if you've got a good enough eyesight, you can see that that's a proper $10 note. I know times are getting a bit tough. Some of us are finding that uh, the dollar doesn't seem to go as far as it used to. And so if I decide simply by my own decision that, well, this is now going to be a tender for $12. And so I go along to the bank and I pass over this note and I say, well, it's $12. I'd like $12 coins, $1 coins, please. I won't get it, will I? The cashier will know that that's not $12. If I go down to the corner dairy and go in there and I want something, and I pass over and say, well, it's $12. I want something for $12. I won't get it, will I? Because they know, they know that that's $10. So then for me to call that $12, it's not a counterfeit of anything, is it? It's not a counterfeit of anything because there's no $12 note. But a counterfeit is something that looks like the original. And it will deceive some. So how do the cashiers in the bank know that that's a proper $10 and not a counterfeit $10? Have they been around and studied all the counterfeits possible? No, they haven't, have they? They've studied the true notes. They know the, the, the characters on it. They know the marks on it. They hold it up to the lights. They put it under their screens. They can see that it's a proper note. And so that, that's how it is, church family, 
with us as we study God's Word. We look at His Word and we study it. We study the truth. We compare Scripture with Scripture. Precept upon precept, line upon line. And as we do so, we, we bring ourselves to a fuller knowledge of what God has to say for us or say to us. I'd like to just shift the direction now of what I'm talking about. We're still using Scripture. But I wish to look at the deity of Christ. And so we'll begin in Colossians 2 and verse 9. Colossians 2 and verse 9. Colossians 2 verse 9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I'd like to ask you a question. What does the word all mean? Complete? I, I can't hear much from up here. But what does the word all mean? Does it mean some, a little bit, maybe? The word all, thank you Alice, everything. The word all, it's a very simple word. And uh, I, I well remember, last time I stood up here and spoke, I said, well, I'm not a very highly educated man, and I'm not. I didn't pass the, the fifth form in high school. But I know what the word all means, and that means simply all, everything. All right? So, for in him, that's speaking of Christ, because verse 8, verse 8 says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. So, so the last word, uh, word there was Christ, for in him, so in, for in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that means all the fullness. So it was, it was fair and it was right then for Christ to assert his claim to be the life. So we'll look at that, John 14 and verse 6. John 14 and verse 6. Here Christ asserts his claim. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So here Christ is, is asserting his claim to be the life. When he was speaking to Martha in, uh, in, the, in John 11, John 11 and verse 25, John 11 and verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. We know this story well, don't we, John 11? Lazarus had died. Jesus said it clearly in verse 14. Lazarus is dead. So Lazarus has died. So Martha is having a chat with Jesus about these things. You know, Lord, if you'd come home sooner, Lazarus would have been alive. And so they, they, they went through this with Mary and Martha. But, Martha. but Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. So once again, Jesus claims to be the life. In Colossians, we go back to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. Paul here confirms the attributes of Christ as the source of all life. And verse 4 of Colossians chapter 3 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall, all, shall ye also appear with him. So there we have it again. Paul, in fact, is, is asserting that Christ is our life. So no created being, human, angel, or even Lucifer in his unfallen condition, could be described as the life. For all creatures have life in them from the one who had life original, unborrowed, and underived. Christ could not be the life if he himself possessed 
borrowed life, even if that borrowed life came from the Father himself. So Christ had his own life, the life. Christ declared himself to be, in Revelation 1 and verse 8, Alpha and Omega. Revelation 1 and verse 8. Jesus says, says this, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Thinking about that point, Christ is not stating here that he had a life, that, uh, is not stating his life had a beginning and therefore will come to an end. When he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, he is not saying that my life had a beginning and that it will have an ending. Christ himself is saying that he, Alpha and Omega, his life is from the eternity past unending and into eternity future unending, or should I say from eternity past it had no beginning, into eternity in the future it has no ending. So the, the life here re refers to Christ's unending life from the from how can we understand the beginning? How can we? Because we know that he has no ending. It would defy logic to claim that the Alpha referred to in this period is a time when Christ never existed. In Revelation 21 and verse 6, Christ uses similar wording. Revelation 21 and verse 6. He says, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. It's important to note that the Alpha and Omega here are connected with the water of life. This tells me that the Alpha and Omega both refer to Christ's life eternally in the past and again eternally in the future. The Apostle John, who in fact was probably or appears to be the favourite, he was certainly the beloved, he wrote a lot about Christ in his life. So in John chapter 1 and verse 3, the Apostle says this, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If one single thing, if one single thing had been created before Christ began his work of creation, that statement would be a false statement. Where it says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If Christ was created, if Christ emanated from the Father at some time in the distant past, then it means that he was a created being. Therefore, he could not claim to be the life. There could be no claim that he created all things. The prophets of old be a testimony to Christ's eternal existence. In Isaiah 9 and verse 6, let's go back to the Old Testament. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. And this says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This passage may not be used to refer to the Heavenly Father, for he never came to earth as a child. For unto us a child is born. Micah is another text that shows us. So let's turn to Micah. Micah. 
chapter 5 and verse 2. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. The prophet states, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Christ's right to be acknowledged by the term is clearly stated. And even the Father referred to him as Son. We'll turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. Verse 1 says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by his prophets. So it initially starts off by speaking like, like God is there. And so it says here in verse 8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. That's Hebrews 1 and verse 8. Now we'll go back to Isaiah, Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Isaiah 7 and verse 14. You know, church family, particularly young people, moving through the Bible, turning from Scripture to Scripture, is very good practice. One day, somebody, some of your friends will ask you a question about Bible about why you're a Christian, why you believe in Jesus, why you believe in God, and all the different things as to why you keep the Sabbath. And if you familiarize yourself with Scripture, turning the pages, looking through, you will become proficient in doing so. So Isaiah 7 and verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so we know that from... Matthew 1, Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. It tells us what this word Emmanuel is. And here we find, it says here, beginning in verse 22, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which, being interpreted, is God with us. We'll turn now to John chapter 1 again. These verses are very powerful. I read, read, read verse 3, but we'll, we'll read now verses 1 to 4, and then verse 14. John chapter 1, 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, we have it stated again. And the verse says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Church family, have, uh, is the picture that I'm trying to build taking shape in your minds? Are you seeing that the one who is called the Christ, Jesus, was God from eternity past, and will continue to be so into eternity future. One with the Father. I 
I have a piece of this from the Spirit of Prophecy here. The first selected message is page 247. And this is what it states. While God's word speaks of the humanity of Christ when upon this earth, it also speaks decidedly regarding his pre-existence. The word existed as a divine being, even as the eternal Son of God, in union and oneness with the Father. From everlasting, he was, the, he was the mediator of the covenant, the one in whom all nations of the earth, both Jews and Gentiles, if they accept him, were to be blessed. The word was with God, and the word was God. Before men or angels were created, the word was with God and was God. In Desire of Ages, page 50, there's part, here's this famous quote. Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. That's a powerful quote. Powerful testimony. You know, church, the man who hung on the cross, who was he? He was Christ, yes. But he was God. His divinity was clothed with humanity. That he could come to this earth and that his glory wouldn't scare people away. The beauty of his love, the beauty of his mercy drew people to him. As I was contemplating this, this sermon time, I was thinking about the one who hung on the cross. And I thought, thought this point through. If God walked to the edge of heaven... And he looked down and he said, well, I'm not going there. I'm going to send one of my created beings. Then who hung on the cross? A created being. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 4, it says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Why not? Because they were created. So just, just let that sink in momentarily. <clears throat> Pardon me. The blood of bulls and goats, were, they, they were created. So they were set in, in place as a symbol of the one who was to come, who was not created. So when God stepped to the end to the edge of heaven and look down at this fallen world he looks down at you and I and he said I in the form of my son who is equal with, equal with me in every way will go and redeem the lost that tells me church family how much Christ how much God and how much Christ love you and I There is a story in the in um, um, early writings where in the council room of council's room of heaven, the the um, Godhead is deciding what they are going to do with the fallen human race. My paraphrase of the story: the Godhead are deciding what they're going to do with with the human race, and so it is decided that the Son will go down and redeem the fallen human race. Jesus comes out from the council chambers and he presents to his angels what the plan is to be. And he said, we are going to redeem them. And the angels, hurrah, fantastic. Then Jesus explains to the fallen angels, what is to, uh, what, to, to his angels, the unfallen angels, what is to take place. And he says, I am going to go down to earth <clears throat> as, a, as, a, <clears throat> as a baby. And I am going to redeem the human race. 
And the angels go, oh. Then Jesus explains it a little bit further. He says, I'm going to lay aside my divinity and clothe myself with, or lay aside my glory and clothe my divinity with humanity. And the angels go, oh. And then he says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die an ignominious death. And the angels go, oh. And they start to say, I'll go. Send me. Send me. Jesus explains that only God who created humanity can redeem fallen humanity. <clears throat> I trust, church family, that this morning, as you've contemplated the Bible verses that I've used, the spirit of prophecy points that I've pointed out or quoted, that today you catch a fresh glimpse of who your Saviour is. Because my sermon title, and I, gave, I saved the, the beginning till the end, is, Oh, what a Saviour. So do, do the singers come forward now and, and help us sing? I'd rather have Jesus than anything. <laughs> 